Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is, I think, a unique occasion. Um, just beautiful to have uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander elders among us this morning. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to hand over to um, Uncle David, who's going to give us an acknowledgement of country. Thank you so much, Uncle David. Everybody. Uh, my name is David Miller and I'm a descendant of the Gungaloo people of central Queensland, just uh, west of Rockhampton. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners whose land we are now standing, the Turrible people north side of the Brisbane River and the Yagra people south side of the Brisbane River, the Kwandamooka people of Straybank Island. I'd also like to pay my respects to my elders, past, present and emerging. And may I just add, we walk softly, gently, respectfully on our lands, on all our lands. Thank you. Thanks Uncle David. Uh, so, welcome everybody. I was just going to ask if our panel could introduce themselves, please. Hi, I'm Ramina Waldron um, and I coordinate the Aboriginal Catholic Ministry and um, I feel very honoured to be part of this gathering today. So, thank you very much for the invite to be able to participate. My name is Chrissy Ellis. I'm the Reconciliation Action Plan Coordinator for the Anglican Church Southern Queensland Diocese. And I'm Boogerman for Granok and Ipswich. And I'd also just like to highlight that my mother is present here today. Oh, sorry, I'm Olivine Yasso. Um, I'm from, uh, my dad's from the Iman tribe around True, um, up the Dawson River area. And my mum is from the Bowen region. Um, oh, sorry, my role is the Cultural Capability Facilitator, Indigenous, with Anglicare South Queensland. My, <clears throat> my name is Rose Elu. I'm, I'm um, originally from the, from the Torres Strait, the top islands of the Torres Strait, an island called Saibai. But my family lives up on the tip of Australia, a community called Saisia. I'm currently here in, well, I've been in Brisbane for the last 30 odd years. I'm a, um, one of the wardens for the um, uh, Torres Strait Islander non-geographic parish within the Diocese of Brisbane. Mm -hmm. I also work as a counsellor and wellbeing officer for the Relationships Australia-Queensland. And my um, tribe is a uh, Chipkin tribe. I come from a crocodile clan on my father's side and a snake and the southern cross from my mother's side. That's how I saw Thank you. And my name's Kylie, I'm Ravina's daughter, and I work in the area of community development, mainly around in the area of West End, servicing a lot of our people on the ground, so that's us. Now I'll kick off the questions, so I'll throw this out to our panel. Why is NAIDOC Week relevant and important? Any Rose, would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess um, uh, NAIDOC for me, I, I think it's um, very important for, for Torres Strait Islanders to be part of this national celebration. And I think it's in recognition and acknowledging and um, reconciling and being together with our non Torres Strait Islander uh, people in the communities of um, Nation Australia and this particular time, Queensland. Yeah. And, um, and I guess it's a, it's a time of learning, continuation of learning from one another and being there for one another, understanding, listening and um, participating. And like we are here this morning, the lovely people come over and listen to us. I think this is a continuation of uh, the, the, the walk um, of our people, our original transgender people. Um, especially here in the centre of Queensland. 
uh, this is also um, uh, largely celebrated throughout the Torres Strait as well, uh, because we have got uh, people all around the islands and on the tip of Australia, where I come from. I, actually, I just arrived back from Thursday Island last night. Can't believe it's cold weather, but um, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was on my tongs and everything, and the <laughs> breeze was blowing, and it was really lovely. But yeah, I, I, I just um, feel that this is relevant for our people, for all of us as well, to be together, united in one body in Christ, as so. Mm. Thank you, Auntie. Um, <laughs> for me, um, why it's relevant and important is um, now is, is about celebrating everything that we are and, and it's our week um, of just being proud within our identity um, you know, given that for quite some time we, we haven't been able to or we're, we're not we haven't been allowed to be proud of who we are so um, NAIDOC is really important I think that's why it's, it's just grown in strength from its inception <coughs> today um, and now it's about getting our um, with the wider community to um, join in with us and celebrate all things that's that's great about us because we, we have a lot to give and we have a value and worth to Australian society. Um, so I also see it as still as a bit, bit of our resistance and activism as well. It's us saying we're still here and we want to be um, uh, engaged and, and um, we want people to come in and, and join with us we are very relational people yeah. um, and, we, and we do want to you know, reconcile with community um, and enjoy our, our culture is so beautiful you know we're the longest living culture in the world um, there's learnings from us you know but just being a part of that week it, I think for me would just it's always been a passion of mine for all of Australia to be able to celebrate it um, they keep talking about an Australia day I think like made up with me is like my Australia day. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, first, for me, NAIDOC um, is a modern day form of corroboree for us to be able to come together to share our culture, um, to celebrate um, who we are as a people. Um, it's also about, I guess, acknowledging the survival of our people um, and our existence and our continued existence. Um, it's for, I think, for 2018, the most important thing for me um, is about celebrating Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, um, who we are, our achievements, um, and yeah, it's an important time for us to, to come together, but it's also an opportunity for non-Indigenous people to find pathways to walk with us in celebrating and learning about our culture um, and also participating I think in various events that take place throughout the community, the wider community and also the church community. That's true. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with what everybody else has said on the panel. Um, and NAIDOC um, for me is always a busy time and because if we think about um, the NAIDOC celebrations within the church uh, it was the church who um, kicked off the NAIDOC celebrations many years ago and that we still continue and honour that today. It's always a really busy time for us within the churches and within the schools and within all the wider communities to get together to celebrate NAIDOC but also to remember um, those people that have gone before us, those people who have paved the way for each and every one of us to be able to stand here today and to be able to speak and to share our stories and to engage with the wider community. You know, there's so much work yet to be done about the whole understanding of, of what is NAIDOC. You know, it's about recognising our First Peoples, but recognise the fight that we've had within each and every one of us. Recognise and acknowledge our freedom fighters as well, male and female. You know, and for our young people today, which is where I work a lot within the community of, of youth today, um, you know, for a lot of those young people don't even know what NAIDOC means, you know, they don't even know that we have a massive celebration at Musgrave Park um, every year where we have roughly around 20 to 23,000 people that attend that function down on at Musgrave Park. It's a great day for us to come to share our culture, the richness of, of our culture, and for all Australians to be proud of Australia's first peoples. Um, 
you know, like that there's so much that we're yet to learn and um, and to walk that pathway together. It's always about two way learning. Okay, so um yeah, so NAIDOC to me is always very important, it's very emotional because we think of those people that, that walked the talk and fought hard to enable us to be here today. So I remember those old people that have gone before us. Um, they've always, we're always going to be looking up to them, you know, people like Kath Walker, Mum Shirl, um, all those people we should never ever forget because we wouldn't have a lot of those agencies and services that we've got today if we did not have our freedom fighters then. Mm -hmm. Can I just also add one other thing? Um, the importance of NAIDOC too, I think, um, the foundation of it with William Cooper, um, who was also, I guess, um, strong advocate back in the early days in the 1930s. Um, NAIDOC actually was established and founded by him. Um, he was also a strong Christian man. He was a Yorta Yorta man from um, Victoria. So I think that um, what we have today um, in celebration um, has also evolved out of, you know, um, as Anna Ravina was talking about, those freedom fighters that actually advocated and fought for the rights of our people so that we can still um, have a day of celebration that commemorates our lives. Very true. Thank you. Uh, what Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander women influenced you on a local <coughs> or personal level? I'll throw that to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I look, on a, on a local level, when I think about um, the women in our lives, like, you've always got to remember, you know, like our extended families, um, there's so many people within our within our community, within our mind that have inspired me over over many, many years. But I, I often think back to her grandmother who was um at it during Bandy and her family were removed and and I think um how hard it was for her, you know, like the journey and so for her she's inspired me to be able to come here today and and, and sort of gather with the church and to speak about the history and to make sure that we always remind people of our stories and so I can never forget the women in our in our lives in our communities and that goes for every woman that's ever crossed my pathway there's always been a challenge and that's what we we're, we're here to do um, if I think about Christian leaders within our community as well you know we've got only Jean Phillips who who has walked the talk for many many years and um, she's encouraged each and every one of us as uh, church workers within the community and I, and I give thanks for her as well um, I think about, um, you know, people like Aileen Morton Robinson from Strobrook, you know, what she's done for women here today, um, it inspires each and every one of us to say, hey, look, we can all go along and, and get an education and, and go all over the world and spread the good news about Aboriginal people back here in Australia and to fight that issue of whiteness. What is whiteness? What is the privilege of, of the whiteness as well? And what's the challenges there for each and every one of us? So, you know, there's lots of women that have inspired me um, all around here in Australia. Mum Shirl, you know, um, I've left her book over here for Mum Shirl. When we think about what Mum Shirl's done for Aboriginal people, um, you know, we've still got a fight and we're still looking at closing the gap, which is what Mum Shirl was on about, housing and health. You know, we're still discussing those issues that she fought for many, many years ago. Um, yeah, there's been so many women, I guess, in our in our life, you know, and that goes all the way down to even my daughter inspires me for the work that she does and, and for the people who she reaches out to. You know, women today, I think we give up so much within our own personal life to enable better quality of life for others in our community. And it's not just for Aboriginal people, we also do that for non-Aboriginal people too. Mm -hmm. So two-way learning, so important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I brought my mother today because um, she's my rock. <laughs> um, and I guess reflecting, you know, going through these questions last night, I was trying to describe you know, what she is to me. And she epitomises what, um, I guess, a strong, deadly black woman is, which is the next question, but um, <laughs> she's been the greatest influence um, within my life. Um, I'm a Nona girl, so I'm surrounded by four brothers, all men, um, so that's been good, but um, my mother, um, my grandmother, 
um, who passed away when I was quite young, um, but I had the privilege of learning um, and, and having her nurtured by my mother. Um, and also, um, Annie Ravina was talking about Annie Jean. Um, you know, Annie Jean talks about um, elders, you know, within the community that we should never forget about. And one of the elders that she always talks to me about or teaches me about is my granny Nellie Thomas. Um, he was a very faithful, strong, um, Aboriginal um, Christian leader within the Shebu community. Um, so to learn about that um, and also to know that um, my great-grandmother, um, my grandmother, my grandmothers and great-grandmothers and my mother um, have all influenced me um, and I'd say that they're the most important um, out of I think all the women within society that have had an influence on me but I think that um, you know there's also a lot of other women within community, within church community, within the workplace um, that also come along as mentors um, you know and help support us um, and I'd also I'd like to make mention, you know, within the Anglican Church itself, you know, Annie Alex Gator, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think just her, her commitment, her dedication towards ministry and God's work, um, and also ministry within Aboriginal community um, has also been something that has influenced me and who I am um, and helps me to keep going forward. And also Annie Jean and Annie Ravina and Annie Rose. Um, but also, you know, the sisters that walk beside us and also the younger generation, you know, they've also had some impact on um, influencing and shaping me um, to become the best person that I can be and to leave a legacy for them to walk behind me like my grandparents and my forefathers and foremothers have done for me. Very true, thank you. Um, I'm sort of along the same lines as Chrissy, um, my mum. Is when I was reflecting on this last night, I didn't actually, she was just the predominant person um, um, that influenced my life. Um, but she would have turned 70 tomorrow and we lost her at the start of the year. Um, but for her, she, um, at, each, at a young age, she had epilepsy, um, which she um, got healed from. She was a very strong Christian woman. Um, she came down to Brisbane here, studied um, uh, to be a minister, and then went straight from here up to Darwin to, um, um, she was the first um, um, pastor at the Assemblies of God in, in Darwin. Um, she did that until the, they got a pastor um, to be full time. Um, so that's just a bit of her journey, but she raised four, four young children by herself. Um, you know, she would drive from Catherine to Bowen by herself, just with us four kids. Just the strength of this woman, um, it's who I am and what's made me who I am. Sorry, <laughs> trying to get upset. Um, um, yeah, but the, I think too, education was really huge for her. The number one was God, um, education. Um, she went back to uni at a late um, stage in her life and became a, a teacher. Um, and then taught at Palm Island before she passed. Um, but she's she's probably the um, most influential person in my life. Um, she, I think she was one of the healthiest pe person alive, but still, um, you know, died too young because of, um, the, I think it's the foods and stuff like that, and, and, and this, what the lifestyle that we have today in society. She was always a very healthy eater and ended up succumbing to um, cancer, which you know, wasn't very good. But um, she was she was my role model and um, everything that I am is because of her, um, which is the thing of today. Um, the other ones are <coughs> my other mothers. <laughs> I've got a, quite a few um, in our family, like most Aventosha on the family. You don't generally have one mother, <laughs> you have a whole heap. <laughs> um, and they all teach you different things, you know. <laughs> like mum only made us eat healthy, where you go to the aunties and they'd give you heaps of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, you know, music was a big part of our life as well. Um, cooking, food, um, just, just 
that family and looking after each other. And it didn't matter if, if you're part of our family or not, if you're at our house for dinner times around or if you're at an auntie or uncle's house, you sit down and you have dinner with them. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, they always took in people. Uh, one of the biggest things um, we were taught was to serve uh, from a very young age. It was always um, service to others, always thinking of others and not ourselves. So I think one of the big things she, my whole family, um, sort of taught me was that humility and, and that um, to be of service to others. Um, yeah, and then there's heaps locally as well. Um, I, for me, I tend to go more to the people I work with in community. So they, um, you know, people such as um, I mean, sort of Barney. She's been a really big influence. Anita Summers, uh, Linda. Uh, she used to be Linda Williams. I can't say her new name. It's very hard. <laughs> um, but they they're the unsung heroes that you probably never hear about. Um, they just some of the work they've done in when I worked in government and just in community. Um, you, you don't realise how much change they made because they're not out in the forefront, but they're the the people on the ground. Shante Link, another one. Only Karen Fuzzi. Um, there's all these um, people that you may never ever hear about. But they are doing some wonderful stuff in the community and they're fighting the cause and I love their strength. Mm. Um, a lot of them, are like most of us, have gone through you know, a lot of heartache and a lot of you know, um, tragedy. Um, but they still get up every day and they, because of that passion for community, their passion <coughs> to see a better, better tomorrow for our, our people. So, um, yeah. <laughs> you better stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. Yeah. Um, I come from a from a culture of uh, the, is like I said before the chicken clan. Um, we have the structure in this clan that you know in those days that men were the always influential figures in our in our tribe. My father was the elder, but during the period of time. He comes from a family of 14, and most of them are the plenty of aunties. And he was a second eldest, and he was also a chief. And through the times when he was, even mom were having, having us, there's 14 of us, I'm kind of picked down from the end. <coughs> and everybody had the status in, 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 the, in that uh, structure. And um, he then changed the laws, the, our tribal law, into that of equality of, um, of the responsibilities for men and women, for, for his children. So we became equal, you know, <coughs> you know, whatever they do, and we have the same kind of thing. So hey, I, I was brought up instructed, and was very disciplinary, and um, a lot of people around to, to um, advise and nurture me, taught me things, um, my aunties, and um, my mom's sisters, uh, like um, this girl mentioned, you know, we don't have a we don't have a praise for aunties and uncles, everybody, mums and dads, when you're from the extended family. Uh, so those people were into influential in my life, <coughs> and um, and then because I was always not a listener in the family, I was a uh, <coughs> thing, you know, like I, I overruled my other brothers. And <laughs> <laughs> So I came a long way, but um, I guess you know because that area in the 1950s and 60s, when when there's a lot of impacts on the Torres Strait and things were changing, then our, our parents were then say, saying to us, you know, there'll be a change of lifestyle and there'll be categorically different levels of um, learning in, in life, whatever. Are we going into another culture, like speaking in English and all that type of thing? And um, so that was like a challenging part of my life, um, been walking through that and, um, and, and listening to people, um, stories and songs and, uh, about our people in the Torres Strait. Then, of course, moving away from, 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 uh, from Cape Town to Melbourne, which is a very different um, Air, you know, a very different part of my, my life, um, like coming from Cape down to the most, you know, southern part of the Australia. I don't know what in English. And um, 
and then there were people in there like sisters of the church and and they were kind of like you know for me they were you know when I look back there, there were things that I did in Croatia as well and and they could be my mentors because they were the ones that taught me how to speak in English and um, all these type of things. And then moving up to Brisbane and then the first thing that I did because I'm a Torres Strait Islander, this is not my land. And um, I made myself my own business to engage with the elders, the aunties from this area and, and sit tirelessly with them all hours at Charlotte Street when I joined the public service. Just listen to all the stories about about the Aboriginal people of this area and still learning. So they were influential in my in my, in my part of life. And um, and of course, I'm a people's person too. I like talking to people, and I like engaging people freely. And, um, and there was also non-indigenous uh, uh, people that were influential in my life, life like that white mom and dad in Melbourne, and my two sisters. I still call them sisters. They're still living. They're part of my life. They were influential with me. One was a school teacher. The other one was a kind nurse. And um, so those things were very important in a way to, uh, to be able to walk, walk the talk and walk, walk through the path freely. And um, you, can, you can mention so many names, even the university days, the people that were there for us when we were got battling for our studies at the university and all that, you know, they were women. And there was only five of us in those days, the 1980s, to enroll in the University of Queensland. It was a hard task for us, but we were there with one another. You know, most of them were women, but there was only two men. So we, we overruled them. So we had to do what to do. do. Um, I guess, you know, when then, of course, my mommy died at the early age as well. And uh, so my father was mother and father for us, and my auntie as well. And uh, so the biggest part of my life, the challenges, and everything else would start from there. And I think that guided me through my life journey in a way, how I reach people and how I become part of that, part of the community. Not only my community, the community at large, Aboriginal community, <coughs> non non Torres Strait and Aboriginal community. And for me it's important also to talk about things that are changing ideas or listening and debating and sometimes getting a little scruffy when people don't understand me, like this morning. <laughs> so, but I came with like a little thing, but um, <coughs> nevertheless, I think that there are so many influential women out there, you know, in all cultures, and I think it's just that, that matter of that understanding of one another, how you how you engaging with them and how you get the strength from one another and be able to understand and live with it, you know, harmoniously and, um, yeah, that's so. all. Thank you. So the next question is, which is quite clear, because there are very strong black deadly women sitting here right now, <laughs> um, and it's a real privilege to sit amongst everybody here. What are the attributes of a strong black deadly woman? Who would like to start that? Um, they're all deadly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would, as I mentioned before, um, my mother epitomises what a strong, deadly black woman is. Um, she's a woman that has nurtured me and my brothers for all our life and continues to nurture us until I think, yeah. <coughs> I think the resilience that she has um, lived through and experienced um, through. I guess not only living under the Act within Queensland, um, you know, the, the, oppress the oppression, I think um, lifestyles, you know, back on Palm back in those days, um, but also um, experiencing a lot of family violence, which led her to, I guess, um, leave the island to protect her children, um, coming to mainland, um, trying to establish a new life in a new big city, um, away from community and family, but um, just the strength of being able to not only look after her children, um, you know, we were all little then, I was only six weeks old when you left Palm, um, and 
and uh, come to Brisbane. She nurtured my grandmother um, until she passed away when I was probably about five years old. Um, and I guess, you know, me being an only girl, um, as Aunty Rose was saying, a bit of a strong-headed um, woman, um, Still. gave her a, a lot of strife in my teenage days. Um, but um, just the love, you know, um, being able to just love us, you know, through good and bad. Um, but. Yeah, she's still there for us, so I guess for me, um, she's my everything. <laughs> and she, I guess, has given me the life to be able to um, be who I am today, and it's because of her, so thank you, my mother. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, like, this is a, a pretty big question, because um, mm. if I think about... Um, majority of the women, you know, that have fought through the traumas in their lives, um, the whole thing of the history, being dispossessed from their land, from their country, from their families. Um, you know, like, Aboriginal women are so resilient and they've fought long and hard because they're the keepers of our stories, you know. The, the Aboriginal women are, are the ones that um, teach our young children and and I could look at every Aboriginal woman that I know and I think, well, you know, you're just so deadly. And, and what they go mm. through, um, how they push through these issues, you know, you know, we're talking about generational grief and trauma within our community. Mm. And I think, well, our women are still, they're still there, they're still in the, in the fight, you know, we're still walking the talk, we're still out there reaching out for reconciliation. We still want to have some harmony within our communities and within our families as well. Um, and we want that respect. And, and if anything, I could say that um, with Aboriginal women, you know, there's so much for um, let's walk the talk, you know, especially with the reconciliation. They're always the first ones there to come along. And I give thanks to the males too. I can't leave out some of our men as well. But for the women, you know, like I can always ring up and say, hey, sister or hey, auntie, can you make me some damper for a gathering? We're having a church meeting. You know, we're doing this, we're doing that. Um, and, you know, they always come to the table, you know, and they're always wanting and willing to give. And we always push for that extra extra yard, you know, with our mob. Um, and at whatever it takes, you know, we're always willing and able to give more and more and more. And that always surprises me, given the fact of, of um, the position that our young Aboriginal women are in today, and especially our elders, and they've taught us so much um, our elders, you know, they continue to give to us, you know, teaching us about respect, about love. Forgiveness is a big thing, you know, and, um, and that's something that we will always work with and, and walk with and, and forever teach our young people. So I could look at many Aboriginal women um, today and I, and I could give them all, you know, put them all up high there on a pedestal. Um, because they, they need to be there. You know, when you think about our, our children who were forcibly removed um, from our women, you know, even, you know, our own grandparents and, you know, it's not that long ago. And so we're still walking with that, that deep pain, pain. And, you know, for a lot of our mob, we're still feeling that deep shame as well. But we rise above. You know, we, we're resilient. We're sure there's a lot of pain that we're carrying. And we'll have that forever. Amen. But, um, you know, I could look at the majority of our Aboriginal women here in Brisbane. I look at our church leaders that have done some wonderful work, the panel here um, in our community. You know, I could look at every community and I think, wow, you know, women are still pushing. We're still pushing those boundaries. We still want that relationship. We still want that respect as well. And we still want that partnership and friendship. I, I agree with most of what um, the other panel members have said. Um, I, I also looked at um, I said the one word, I had a whole heap of words and I thought robust is sort of the one that mm. sort of captures it all because we're adaptable, uh, you know, flexible, we're resilient. We're resourceful. I love how resourceful our women are. <laughs> I like to, like even sometimes when I have to sit back and think, you know, I have nothing. But I, as I managed to do this, this and this, um, or my mum, you know, 
just making, you know, food fit for kings out of nothing. <coughs> um, you know, I, just, and I think too from that, from that resourcefulness, when you realise that it doesn't matter if you've got nothing, you can still, you know, you can still accomplish what you want to do. Mm. Um, and so that gives you that fight and that courage and that, that momentum to just keep going. Okay, well, I had nothing, I've got this now. <laughs> now I can go to the next level. So I think that robust, resilient um, really talks um, to who we are. And with our, with, um, you know, I've, I've kept thinking about, you know, the tears, the tears that um, our women cry. Um, especially over the, you know, the years and even today, you know, they're still facing these challenges that, um, you know, it, it, it's hard. But they get up every morning and they, they rise, they rise every morning uh, with optimism and hope for the future. Um, you know, and that to me is what I, I think is a strong black daily woman. woman. They never give up, no matter what they're up against, they get up, they rise, they they have that optimism and the hope for the future. Um, and, you know, as we grow older, first it's about your children, then it's about the grandchildren. <laughs> and then it's about the great-grandchildren. You know, at first you rose for your children, but then you rise for them. And you, and you start to, you know, and you, and you just keep going because, you know, that with every step you take towards that better tomorrow, um, you're doing it, you're leaving that legacy for the, the people behind you. And that's, that's mm. Well, they said it all. I haven't had much to say, but, um, well, there are just so many there. And I keep looking back. Um, uh, just three days ago, I was at Bamaga, and I looked at the place, how, how well it's been established and built. And, and there's now um, uh, like bitumen on the road and a lot of, lots of cars. And now I'm sharing with my younger daughter how we used to, when I was going to school, when I started schooling, how our mom used to get up early in the morning to uh, get one of the baskets like that over there, like well, on, on the um, things that we have on the table, to put a dumper and a fish in there or whatever she can cook in the morning and put in those kind of baskets and let us walk five miles from uh, Seishia to, to Bamid up the school. It was a long walk, we'd be playing along and all this, and then there's no worries in the world. We get to the school, to our school here, and then walk back. But I was telling her all this thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying to her that there it was our mother, you know, like for her, like it was just a daily life, and she was the biggest mentor in our life, and we loved her so very much. She's the first and foremost in my life. And um, the coming summer second mothers that are like my aunties and um, the people that I call mums. And it was that kind of thing that she led us through, like, you know, the strength and integrity to be able to walk strong and um, and overcome all this. And for us, was no worries. We'd be playing along the way and get to the <coughs> and come back all in the mud, you know, and dust and everything that we were playing. And, and um, I think through the life, too, in my life, you know, there's uh, challenges that have been facing. There was these women in the Torah Strait that they were leaders and they were also the mentors in our lives to be able to guide us through. Um, historically, when we come to see about the, the movement that we have on this land of Australia and the, and the Melanesia Torah Strait was a very different because we are seafaring people. We can go by canoes from one island to another in those days. And then, of course, when, when the government took over, and there were boats that you have to get the permits and all that type of thing. So women were always up there. There was lots of them. Then we were beautiful women that lead us through and, and tell us what we can and what we cannot do. And I think that growing up and then coming from that Melanesian culture into woven into the, the Aboriginal culture, because I was brought up with the Aboriginal um, grand grannies and um, the land that was given to my father on the Cape. And there was that kind of thing that I, I, I just honor them. They're no longer with us and every now and again we'll be sitting there under this hill and we'll be gazing out the ocean or up in the sky and we see them that there's one star twinkling. That's, that's our great, great grandparents. And then of course with the non-indigenous women like my white mom down in Melbourne, she's no longer with us. 
she was also very influential in my life. She taught me things and she also balanced in a way that there was this Melanesian culture and this Western culture. She didn't enforce anything to me. She wanted me to just learn through on my daily walk in life. I think those were the very um, things that I, I remember very well and I always have them in me and it's actually written down every day in a way that when I remember them, I remember the things that they say. And then there's um, Aboriginal sisters that I have here in the Deadly Women and we all call ourselves deadly, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of you are deadly, of women, not the men. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the right thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I think this, yeah, it's, it's just beautiful to have that, you know, like that the women that can help one another and be there for us and tell stories and do things. And if you don't understand, you ask questions and you listen carefully and, you know, like those kind of things. So I am very blessed with the women that, that mentored me and part of my life. And I will continue to have that kind of relationship with people that I love. Thank you, Auntie. Why should we celebrate Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, and particularly our elders? Me. <laughs> you just caught my eye. Just got to stop looking at it. <laughs> um, I think we've, we've touched on so much. Um, what One of the, uh, there's just a couple of words um, that I've written down and, and I had mentioned too is um, that the women are the nurturers in our family, they're the central. The, the central of the fam center of the family. Um, you know, you, you know, dad's out working, mum's usually home. Um, mum's sort of everything, because she's our world, our central. Um, and so the women and and Aboriginal women in in um, our lives and our families are, are central and they're the nurturers and and we need to honour them and celebrate um, that value that they have in, in in our society, in our culture. Um, yeah, and they're, they're the two words that I sort of thought of with with um, um, that question, how, why should we celebrate every Tosha women? And elders in particular, um, you know, they're just so, they're wisdom. I like, for me, I, I have um, elders that I, I run just about everything past. Um, Especially like with the work I'm doing at the moment, um, you know, you, you think you you know it all. You know, I've been to uni, you know, postgraduate degree, all that, but I still go and check in with them because they will tell you straight. Mm. They will be honest. Um, they'll they'll challenge you. You know, um, sometimes we you know we try to take the easy road, and they go no 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 no. Um, so they they're for me they're my guide. Um, they keep me grounded, um, and they, um, yeah, they, they're, they're, they're also encouraging, you know, they're always letting me know, um, you know, you're doing it, even when you're feeling like you're doing crap, they'll say, no, bub, you're doing well, just yeah. keep going, you know, just put that one foot in front of the other, um, but yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Honey, Rose, yeah. you have anything else to add from that question? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, oh yeah, the women that, that we are the, uh, the elders are, and, and the women that we see as the keepers of knowledge, <coughs> the wealth of knowledge that they carry, and uh, that we continue to learn every day. And uh, in, in my culture, we have a very medical structure, like you know, at the end done verbally, we don't have nothing written on, on, on things like we have to. The knowledge is stuck uh, from here on top down. And it just everyday things evolves around our lives. So, um, the, um, just the other day I had to, uh, I was presenting in a children's court and, and for the judge to really understand the culture of a Torah Shadal extended, extended family. In a way of, you know, how we, how we as a, as, as, a, as a structure of the family, how we nurture our children, how we pass on the knowledge for our children and, and teach, teach them and taught them about the things that are, that are right. Um, so it can be, the, uh, in a way, because if you don't know, you don't understand, you know, like, because you don't understand, you, you haven't seen it in black and white, you know, it works in that way, how women, um, 
you know, that influence us, you know, with that, um, in, the, in the structure. Um, so um, I guess, you know, there's just so much, so much that we can say. And then because um, in the Torah Strait, in my, in my culture, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually not in that elder category as yet. I'm still learning from them. Like recently, I was I'm sitting with the, with the women from Central Islands, and they were telling me the stories of the sandbars of tall islands, and uh, you know how it is around them, and how they how they survive every day. Like we have a climate change, and all those things happening, and things happening in the Torres Strait. So it was too deadly. And then you, when I when I was in Cairns, and there were uh, aunties from Yaraba, like I I like going and sitting with them, and. and just listening, I forget about my work. I just sit there all day with them, <laughs> munching and whatever they cook for me, and I'm there. And then I go by book and sign off as if I'm doing the work. <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's a dog here. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, so they're just influenced. Like, you, you cannot, you know, and there's also non indigenous deadly women out there. There are women out there also that have to laugh with it. Thank you, Auntie. Oh, I, look, I think um, the role with the elders and, and why they're so important for us because um, because they're women, you know, and because of her we can. Um, if I think about, especially the role within the church and within the community, for me, I've always been told that you can't move doing things in the community unless you've got the approval of those elders, unless you've informed the elders of what's happening in within their region, within their community. And it makes sense, you know. If you don't get their approval, you can't move. And and I think it's good because, you know, they know a lot more than what we do. You know, like we forever look up to their elders to get the seal of approval. Um, and at no matter what age, we're always learning something new from our elders. They're the keepers, you know, and they hold and contain everything. They know what's happened well and truly before I've come along. So... We should always run things back through our elders within our communities. Look, it's the same thing within, within our church structure as well. If there is something that's going to be happening within the church, we always go to the elders and ask the elders, if, would you like to participate? Are you going to be here? It's really important to have their approval. Yeah. And there's nothing more satisfying than having your elders to support you on different things that you're doing within your community, yeah. you know, at all different levels. Yeah. Um, and the elders are just so important to each and every one of, one of us. And I look up to our elders in the church and outside the church because if it wasn't for those elders, we wouldn't be here today. You know, they are our fighters. As I said before, they were our freedom fighters. They were the people that protected the children. You know, they kept the families together. You know, if we didn't have them to give us the direction where we're going, you know, we'd probably make a lot more mistakes than what we have. And if anyone is able to ever settle any peace within our community, you need the elders. And I'll give you a good example. We could come together at Musgrave Park and have a lot of issues down there for our Aboriginal community of South East Queensland. But you know what? As soon as that one person speaks like Annie Jean Phillips, my goodness, there's peace. You know, all that squabbling is settled right down. She brings a presence. Honey Alex brings a presence, you know, so I look at those elders here and I think, thank God for them because sometimes things can escalate, but as soon as an elder speaks, everyone will listen and give them that utmost respect um, that we will acknowledge them. What they've said goes. You know, even within the church when there's someone we're thinking about who might have the qualities to be ordained or somebody that we think would be a really great church leader and to move us forward and to lead us forward in the church. You know, that's all going to be approved by, by your elders within your community as well because they know a <coughs> lot, lot more than what you do of that person and it goes beyond that person. It goes on to their family, the generations of their family, their connection also within church boundaries as well. So, you know, the elders play that important role doesn't matter at what level. Look at the elders' role that we bring them into the school to educate school children. And not only just the school children, but those teachers who are teaching our children in those schools. They've still got so much more to learn. And, you know, I always say to those children too, I say, you've also got grandparents who would be elders, and I'm sure that you look up to them as well in the community the same as what our mob do. And it's really important to honour and to respect our elders at all levels right across the board. Mm. 
I think pretty much everything that I wanted to say is already been said. So I <laughs> pull out of my brain what's different. Um, but I guess the I guess one of the things that I would like to add is that um, women are the life givers. Um, we exist today because of women. Um, it's not to say that men don't play in the Yeah, so I guess um, just that, that nurturing. Um, and women gives us strength and support, um, especially when um, we might be facing cultural issues. Um, and I guess when we're talking about, you know, like um, our culture, you know, like women's business and men's business, um, we all have a, a part to play, you know, within our roles, within community, within our kinship structures, um, but also, you know, within the workplace, um, just knowing our roles. Um, I guess just with the with the elders. Like Ravina was saying, um, you know, elders play an important part in our lives. Um, they are our teachers, um, they are our law keepers, hold us our knowledge, our stories, our songs, our dances. Um, and I guess a part of our kinship systems as well as, and also I guess laws of, you know, governance, they, they do hold a very high level of esteem within our communities. Um, and I found it really interesting one day because um, when I went to <coughs> church service, um, a non-Indigenous auntie said to me, you know, like, um, I really wish that non-Indigenous young people would pay as much respect towards our own as what you do with your culture, um, you know, with our own, you know, Aboriginal culture. And I sort of looked at that and I thought, well, it is quite significant, you know, um, because it's not only, you know, within how we treat each other as people of culture, but also, you know, carrying that into our relations with non-Indigenous people as well, um, and just loving everybody, um, just genuinely. Um, if there's somebody in need, you know, um, especially the elders, they're, they're always there, it doesn't matter what cultural background you come from, what lifestyle you live. Um, yeah, they're always there to, to support. So I think that's one of the, the greatest gifts that they give to us, especially younger people. Thank you. As an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander woman, what insights or advice do you have about exercising leadership? All these women are leaders. <laughs> Strong leaders. Annie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I'm just going to give you an uh, example of my structure in my tribe. Um, each and every one of us got our status within the family. Um, like they're given to us what we do within the family and, and how we, how we, um, how we uh, exercise that outside of our family structure within the community and the community at large. Um, also, my brothers are always, always the, um, they're, they're, they're the chiefs, like they're the ones that hold the authority um, to, um, to um, sign off things or say things and, you know, uh, or discuss things or take the lead on saying things. Where I'm sitting in my family is, I have a leadership role that was given to me right from the very time that when I was born. Um, and I think in a way to I've always been a loud voice in the in the family, like I always debate and um, one of the structures that my family used to do is when my when we all fighting with one another, the, uh, the kids, my father would just go like this and we all sit around a circle on the mat and then he'll, he'll, he'll start let us fight, you know, he said, They're gone, go go for it and what were you talking about? What were you debating about? And what was the problem? So we all into one another, not eating or something, but all talking. And, and I was always the last one to, to say things because I don't want them to overrule me. And I always say I'm the last one. And uh, being his favorite, of course, too, me and my, my other brother. And I thought, he's going to take my part and he's not like that, you know. He always looks at things properly. I think in the, in the, in the time that you always say, well, you'll be a speaker. And uh, one day you'll, you'll, be, you'll, you'll be a good mentor, you'll be a good person out there in the community. 
when, when the incident happened to me one time at the school in Melbourne, that was one of the incidents that I had when, at school when the, when the young girl, because I had a big afro, and uh, she wanted to touch it, but it's, it's a taboo in my culture, so I ran away from her. But she kept on doing it, and then when we had a shower and that, she, she was more or less very agitated by that, and she said three words to me when she put the soap in the palm of my hands. And, um, and then I just put the soap back in the mouth. <laughs> to defend myself because I, I can't speak in English. And that was a challenge in my life. And then I wanted to go home. I, I got up on the chair and I ran home. And I said to my mother and father, why do you send me here? And you didn't tell me that I was going into another dimension, whatever it is. And, um, and I went on and on and on. Mind you, from the tip of Australia, from down Melbourne to the tip of Australia, I'm yelling at them. And, <laughs> And, and telling them off and everything. My poor mother was very quiet sitting there. And then they just listened. Happened. And after a while, he said to me, are you standing or are you sitting? My father said, I'm standing up from you. And he said, now you're going to sit down. So I sat down and he said to me, he said, you OK now? I said, yeah, but I'm coming home. I don't want to stay here. He said, no, you're not coming home. You will stay there. And he says, it goes. One of the things that really captured with me through that time was that he said to me, um, he said, in a word, in an English word, maybe you, more or less, that you can, you can, you can call it deliberately. I, I, me and Mama put you out there deliberately to face the world and face the challenges and face other cultures. We did, we, we put you in there so you can learn for yourself. And then through the years then that he said to me, he said, um, um, Remember that time when you didn't want to come home and uh, you wanted to challenge me, you wanted to stay there, you wanted to just get away from the school and come back and um, just tell me what you were doing. And I told him about that. I was excited. I do things, you know, I talked to people and I was joining the public service and all that and I was doing cross-cultural awareness trainings and all that and, and he said, that's it. And he said, remember that time when I told you that there will be a time and God will permit you and give you time to tell the world and tell the people about us, about our culture. And he said, you're doing a great job. He said, no, you, can't, you will continue to do that. He said, because you have been assigned from out of 14 to be able to do that. And you can teach other women, pass it on to your children or other cousins or whatever. And I think in, the, in that sense, that I've always had that level of that, because I come from that level, and I look at the women, whether they are Christian or Torres or non 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 Torres or Islands women, that I re relate freely, you know, very, because they have that, I can see the thing in them that, you know, that, that suits me. And then I said, oh, this is really deadly, you know, like I can talk to you in that level. And of course, again, with the elders, there's a like paramount of that thing, so I came to learn, okay, I cannot say anything, not make myself good, because there's those elders above me that can still teach me. And about the leadership, and it's, 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 uh, it's still say to me, Auntie Rose, you've gone the wrong way, come this way. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Auntie Jean said to me one day down the, down the whole of Trinity Church, I was doing something, said, Bob, come over here. You're not supposed to be standing over there. <laughs> and I, I mean, like, you know, but I obeyed her because there was that direction for me from her as, a, as an elder as well. And she's not a Torres for that, but she's an Aboriginal person. And yet, that was that passion in her. That she said, come over here, Bob, not there, over here. And for me, that was something that, that I, you know, every day, like, you know, I, I dwell with that. And, and I was more of it every day. Thank you, Auntie. So I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, what advice would you give to non-Indigenous people about supporting and ministering to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and families? Well, the first thing I would say is that really you need to familiarise yourself between the two cultures and, um, and to be aware that, you know, they're very separate cultures and to respect that um, within our traditional groups. And I think that you should be um, out there researching your local histories within the areas um, and, and like I'm just kind of thinking about, especially if you're um, setting up um, any new organisations within there, if you're wanting to go and work in those organisations, 
you know, time and time again when I go out to places and, I, and, and I'm talking of churches and I do get fed up with saying, I know, I understand, I'm married to an Aboriginal person or we have one in our family or my wife's studying Aboriginal histories and studies so they've got all the answers. And that is so frustrating to work with, come on. You know, like, um, don't be so disrespectful. But it, it would be um, really good if people got to familiarise themselves with our systems, um, with our histories, um, with our significant dates or days of celebrations. You know, how do we come on board? How do we um, come together to be able to celebrate these dates and remember those dates? Um, there's, there's so much out there on the internet that I think that we need to do work ourselves. We can't give you all the answers. Um, and I say that to majority of church groups and schools. You know, you too have to walk this talk with us. You know, when we looked at reconciliation out there, I felt that Aboriginal people were doing all the hard work. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, we were working so much, we were totally exhausted, you know, when the reconciliation um, Australia was really fully operating. Um, and we're still doing that work. We're still walking the talk, you know. Um, we become tired, we get exhausted, you know, when we're nearly hitting 60, that we kind of think, gosh, I've given a good part of my life to the whole process of reconciliation to bring about a better Australia and a better future for your grandchildren and my grandchildren, <coughs> our grandchildren. So I think that there's, there's so much yet that we, we can do um, within our communities and it's about getting out there, networking and looking to see what agencies and what services are around that we could all tap into because it's two-way learning as well. And I say this to schools, do you know who are in your area? Do you know your local elders? Do you know what Aboriginal services? You've got an Aboriginal health service here. Why don't schools, why don't communities tap into those? You know, you've got elders groups right across the whole of Southeast Queensland. How often does anybody go out there or invite them into your space for a cup of tea? Instead of always saying, oh, can you come out, just help me do an acknowledgement of country? It's more than that. It's about building up of relationships and respect and understanding. And so don't keep on asking and taking. You know, like, we're happy to give, but we want to have a bit of a partnership as well. So um, I keep on saying it's that two-way learning. So just remember um, about that burnout of our mob. Okay? Um, I think that's really important. But, you know, just try to be understanding it and sort of look at um, what dates and things can be happening, what can we be involved in within our church and within our community, how can we participate, how can we support, even if it's down to, like I say to a lot of the school kids, look, when we come out and give talks to you, what you give to us in kind services, you know, at times it's like tea, sugar, milk, you know, we're coming back to the old ration days, but you know what, we're, we're happy to do that if that's all that people can give. Because when people give to us after coming out there and giving talks and bringing elders into schools and community places, they enable us with their donations of tea, coffee and sugar to come back and help a family in the time of grief, in the time of sorrow. And if that means sitting down and having that cup of tea with people and if that's what all that people have to provide, then so be it. We do that. But um, we're here too to walk along that journey with each and every one of you as well. And we want a brighter future and a better Australia. You know, we want an Australia that's united and proud of our first peoples, you know, and shares in that history. So... There, there, there is a... Um, this, is, this is what I always, always wanted to say when I give a talk to the forum as such. Um, First and foremost, there are two cultures, like Rubina said. There's Aboriginal Australia and Torres Strait Melanesia. Very, very different cultures in communication, everything else in laws. We have a similarities in a way. We might be shame about doing things, but there are great differences because we are all divided into a tribal groups and we have our own apartments as well. I cannot say to the other 16 others where, where my other people from the, from the Torres Strait are from. And I think through the years of um, uh, doing, doing and chatting to our, our uh, people, um, is, you know, at, at large, to the community as such, there is that difficulty or misunderstanding of, uh, because of the historical thing about this nation, the history was then all amalgamated in one. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're all native affairs, you will all have this. But they forget to say that there is a Torres Strait Melanesia. 
The Torres Strait is a Melanesian and Polynesian race of people, and we were once part of the Pacific before 1879 that we were being declared to the state of Queensland. And through our Aboriginal brothers and sisters in 1967 that we became a citizen of the referendum to part of Australia. We struggled through that, so we united that. So we became that, you know, because we have our struggles, our forefathers and that. I think understanding in a way of, of, of like we come out and freely to talk about I must say that, I have to say this to you, I love the Christian people. I, I have a very good vibes about observing people. I think it's because where I come from, my heritage. Like I can give a talk to more than the numbers here. I can feel the vibes from people. You know, are you here for real? Or are you just here for just to know about how Christian trust and That's a question I always raised. So I can feel that. I can feel with the people the impression, the way they are. I'm not, I'm not talking about you, but maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a way of saying that, you know, are you really listening? You took 40 odd years or more for me to be able to learn this beautiful culture, Western culture, that I actually live in, well, part of it, speak it when I got 19 other dialects that I can speak freely. And my, my dilemma always is, I said to the people, why do I speak always in English? Why cannot you take that to speak my language? Then I'll be able to really comfortably communicate with you. And we have a better understanding because regardless of what it is, you will never, ever understand the Torres Strait culture, the language, the communication tactics, and everything else, unless you commit yourself to be part of that body of Christ to be able to sit with me, sleep in the mat with me, listen to the stories, come and dive with me in the ocean, reach the bottom of the ocean to pick up the pearl shell, whatever you want to do. You swim on the reef, you go on the canoe, until such time that I can assure you that you'll be able to have the feeling of, okay, Auntie Rose was talking about this. This is what she meant, and that is belonging. I will forever say this to, the, to our Christian community. To, you know, I can never say that you will be, be like me. Because I came to be like you. Here I am talking English and waving my hands around like a Malaysian woman. You know, like it's not like slapping you, hey, God. <laughs> I, yeah, I love this all. <laughs> you know where I'm coming from, like, you know, because I really, you, you know, I love people. I, I like people to know about me. Like, I like people to sit down and listen, and to be able to, like Ravina said, you know, we go out there and, and we, we go in the rhythm. Like me and David and Ravina, which is reconciliation, which we one party, we just go. And I go, this is deadly, you know, I'm going to bombard again, you know, like, <laughs> saying these beautiful things to our beautiful people. But it's the learning. It's a continuation of being with one another to be able to capture and absorb and be nurtured and embrace mm -hmm. in a way that what Auntie Rose embraced the Western world. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd like you to do, Akali. Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to come back here in this college and be able to make this action again. I'd be able to just say, this is the end to, to embrace you with God's love. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm just a little bit conscious of time. So, Chrissy, did you want to add something to supporting and ministering? I think giving advice around supporting and ministering our women and families. I think um, I know Ravina touched on it before about understanding the communities that you're actually working or living in. Um, I think it's quite critical. Um, I think the Reconciliation Action Plan um, is a pretty good foundation to, to start um, having a look at some of the, the actions that you can consider. Um, practical things, you know, on the ground too with the ministry that you're doing. Um, I think for our women, um, understanding that, and as Sunny Rose was saying before, that um, we are Aboriginal women, but we represent many different tribes, many different countries, um, many different life experiences, so um, being mindful of that um, when you're actually working with us um, and also the fact 
that um, I think being aware of Anna Ravina was talking about, you know, the privilege that um, non-Indigenous people have probably come into, that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do, I guess, experience a lot of social disadvantages, um, you know, social determinants that are totally different to mainstream Australia. So um, maybe being aware of, you know, some of those issues and, and learning about, you know, these issues so that um, when you actually come to work with our women and our families that um, you're better equipped, um, you know, with some foundational knowledge. Um, and I guess referring back to elders, um, you know, the greatest gift that you can have from them is learning from them, you know, um, sitting with them um, and, you know, asking questions and getting them to give you information. Um, failing that, if you can't find elders, um, try to find other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within the community that you can actually talk with, um, you know, that can give you some guidance and advice about maybe the right ways of, of dealing with, um, with our families. I think that um, on a national level, um, some of the current issues that are facing um, quite critical um, issues with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women is the over-representation of our women within the system. Um, I think that we're t 34 times more likely to be um, imprisoned than non-Indigenous um, women and so the impacts that that has systemically um, you know, even with children, you know, it's going to increase so the projecting over the next, I don't know how many years, you know, it's going to go three times more with child protection. So I guess being aware of some of these issues as well. Um, and if you are personally interested in those kind of areas, um, how, how can you make it uh, an impact, um, a positive impact that's going to help address and improve the lives of our people, um, yeah, in the long term. I guess also understanding that um, as Aboriginal women, I go to work, I earn an income, but um, with our laws of reciprocity, I give. So, you know, my, my money just doesn't stay with keeping a roof overhead, um, putting food on my table, but it also helps to provide for my extended family when they're in need, but also other ministries. Um, so I guess being mindful of, you know, ministries that are in existence, um, and I know Aunty Jean um, is quite amazing, you know, with some of the work that she does with, with trying to fundraise, um, you know, especially with Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander leadership. Um, you know, being a part of some of that, you know, coming along and supporting, uh, giving, giving of your time, giving of your resources, <coughs> but also promoting, you know, within churches as well. Um, and also, you know, Ravina with um, a lot of the work that she does with, I think, Money, Murray Ministry, um, funerals, you know, um, women are the backbones of our community, so when things are happening, you know, usually they're the ones that are trying to organise, you know, um, families if they are going through sorry business, so, you know, just understanding, you know, the various ministries that, that are out there um, and, and coming alongside of them and, and supporting um, is probably the key that I would say. Um, and I guess with our children, um, they're our future generation, they are our future leaders. Um, so I guess, you know, if that's an area of passion for yourself, you know, how do we um, engage in that area? How do we um, strengthen their capacity to become educated so that, you know, you, you're breaking the, the cycles of recidiv I guess, well, poverty, but also recidivism, um, you know, it's all interconnected. Um, so just, yeah, just looking at ways that you can contribute towards our cause. Um, that's, I guess, some of my advice. Thank you. I'll just say one quote. Uh, I always say it. It's um, Leela Watson, I Leela Watson, but it was attributed to the um, Brisbane Blacks activist group. Um, it's a quote, you've probably heard it. Um, if you've come here to save me, you've wasted your time. You're wasting your time. But if your liberty is tied up in mind, then let's walk together. Um, mm -hmm. That, to me, is pretty much mine is everything. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. so I'd like to thank the women that have spoken today and shared their wisdom and knowledge. 
Thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Th